Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Rodrigo Maxfeld Gulate was born on the 13th of July 1972 in Foz do Iguacu in Parana, Brazil. He had a sister, Adriana, and a brother, Caiso. He was the son of an obstetrician, Rubens Borges Gulate, and his mother, Clarice, who was born in 1940. His family was an upper-middle-class wealthy family, and he grew up to become a gentle, polite, and tall kid who loved to surf. He was regarded as the cutest boy in school and had a lot of friends. At the age of nine in 1981, determined for his children to have a better education, and his father decided to move the family to Curitiba. However, gradually, Gulate slipped into depression and became involved in drugs, first smoking weed at the age of 14 in 1985. His drug abuse allegedly manifested in 1985 due to his parents' divorce, which was as a result of his father seeing another woman. Initially, his mother did not want to accept that her son was a drug addict, but becoming severely depressed and dependent on weed in 1988 at the age of 16, he went into treatment for his drug addiction, which is when his relatives began to notice that he was demonstrating signs of bipolarity. He attempted suicide in 1989 after overdosing on prescription drugs before his body was discovered by his mother. His aunt, Juliana Golate, stated that he was hospitalized two to three times. His family had a history of mental health disorders, with his grandfather on his mother's side diagnosed with depression and admitted to a psychiatric hospital in 1966. Other family members went to rehab and had experienced bipolar as well as depression. The average age of onset of bipolar is 25, but it can occur in teens, albeit it is rarely detected in childhood. He would continue to receive treatment for his drug addiction, but nothing seemed to work and Gulate became very depressed. His mother helped him to get work, including as a manager of a restaurant, with his mother paying his salary. At the age of 21 in 1993, he had a son Jimmy Gulate who was autistic and with whom he had little contact. However, his drug addiction continued into his 20s. Throughout his 20s, Gulate traveled around Latin America with friends and began drinking frequently as well as taking various types of drugs. Sponsored by his mother, he traveled throughout Latin America, the United States of America, Africa and Europe, during which time he indulged in drugs. However, his mother, Clarice, was hopeful of his travel, stating, I thought these trips would do him well. He would wind down, get rid of bad influences, but this was the complete opposite and his travels only exacerbated his drug addiction. In 1994, he returned to Curitiba and did not work or study. In 1995, he was involved in a serious traffic accident after leaving a party while under the influence of alcohol and drugs. With the car hitting a post, his girlfriend, who was sitting next to him, was injured and left blind in one eye. While Gulate was uninjured in the car accident and managed to avoid arrest, he was admitted in March 1996 to rehab by his mother, where he spent six months before being released in November 1996. Initially given antidepressants, he stopped taking these after a few months. He then went to work on the family farm with a relative in neighbouring Paraguay for four months. Gulate then got into another car accident, overturning his uncle's car. In 1999, he passed the entrance exam to study liberal arts at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, located in Florinopolis, the state capital of Catarina. It is ranked by the QS 2021 World University Rankings as the 22nd best university in Latin America. As a result, he moved to Florinopolis in 2001. There, with his mother's financial assistance, he also opened two restaurants, including a pizzeria, but this became a drug distribution hub. In the middle of his liberal arts course, he dropped out and started smuggling cannabis between Latin America and Europe. In June 2004, after the death of one of his uncles, he told his mother and sister during the funeral, if anything happens to me, don't worry, I live the life I wanted to.
In August 2004, an opportunity came up for him to smuggle 6 kilograms of cocaine into Jakarta, Indonesia, with the drug smuggling operation orchestrated with two other men, both of whom were Brazilian and lived in Jakarta. However, Gulati was playing Russian roulette with his life, as since 1997, Indonesia had implemented the mandatory death penalty for drug trafficking. Gulati was arrested at Jakarta's Sokaran or Hartu International Airport in August 2004. He was arrested with the other two drug smugglers who had eight surfboards stuffed with six kilograms of cocaine, but Gulate took sole responsibility for the transportation of the cocaine, with the other two smugglers able to escape to Brazil. Upon his arrest, his mother was in disbelief. His family alleged that he was enticed by international drug traffickers who were able to take advantage of his mental health difficulties. The family paid a lawyer who absconded with their money and did not show up to Gulata's trial. He shared a prison cell with Brazilian drug trafficker Marco Arce Moriera. By the way, we did a video on the execution of Marco Arce Moriera, so don't forget to check that video out. During his trial, neither a representative of a Brazilian embassy in Jakarta nor his family showed up to his trial as they did not know that his trial was taking place. With no defence as his lawyer had absconded on the 7th of February 2005, Gulate was sentenced to death. In the same year, he experienced his first schizophrenic episode and began to experience difficulties between telling what was real and what was fake. The main saviour for Gulate's life, however, was President Susilio Bambang Yudhiyono, who implemented a moratorium on capital punishment between 2008 and 2013. However, as he was held in prison, Gulate's psychiatric condition worsened and he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, experiencing delusions and hallucinations. These characterised paranoid schizophrenia. While sharing a prison cell with Archer, the pair had a serious disagreement and he was on an emotional edge. In 2006, Gulata attempted suicide in prison but was unsuccessful. He also attempted to set fire to his cell with other inmates inside by setting his clothes and objects on fire. This was as a result of his cat passing away. As a result, he spent 30 days in solitary confinement. His family and psychiatrist, hired by his defence, recommended that he was transferred to a psychiatric hospital, but this was denied by the Indonesian courts. His family continued to try to obtain clemency for him based on his paranoid schizophrenia, but this was denied. His cousin Angelita stated that Gulate doesn't want to go to the hospital. He doesn't accept treatment, much less take medication. Being in a maximum security prison is safe, going to a hospital would be dangerous, he said. He says he hears voices telling him that he will be returning home soon. A Brazilian named Fabiana, who volunteered at the prison, stated that he varied on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes he was super friendly and funny, telling jokes. Other times he was completely silent. She noted that every time she saw him, she saw a boy rather than a man. Irish Roman Catholic priest Charlie Burroughs met with Gulate multiple times during masses that occurred in prison and stated that Gulate began to speak about voices that he was hearing and he also spoke to the walls, warning Burroughs that prison was a safe place and that outside of prison he would be killed. He also began to tell stories that he had lived past lives in Egypt as well as other surreal stories. Other prisoners began to be afraid to share a cell with him. The Brazilian government of President Dilma Rousseff called for the death penalty to be spared for Gulate for humanitarian reasons, but this did not come to fruition. However, President Yudhoyono was constitutionally barred from seeking a third term in office in 2014. In the 2014 election, which was held on the 9th of July 2014, President Joko Widodo won the Indonesian election with 53.15% of the vote as part of a Great Indonesia Coalition. Upon assuming office on the 20th of October 2014, President Widodo warned that there would be no clemency for drug convicts and re-enacted the death penalty within Indonesia. In February 2015, another psychiatric test was done by the Indonesian government which confirmed Gulate's diagnosis as a paranoid schizophrenic. 
Authorities ordered another assessment in March 2015. However, these results were never released by the Indonesian government, despite pleas by his family. Throughout 2014 and 2015, his mental health continued to deteriorate, and he refused to take off a light brown cap and faced backwards at most times, claiming that it was his protection. He also lost about 15 kilograms in weight. Moreover, he also said that he would not go out of prison because there was going to be electromagnetic discharges all over the world with a massive bomb destroying the world. On the 20th of April 2015, his final request for clemency was denied and Indonesia said that he was fit to be executed. Attorney General Dr. H. Muhammad Prasetyo stated to the Jakarta Post that there was nothing to stop Indonesia from executing Gulate, with the law only prohibiting the execution of children under the age of 18 and those who were pregnant. On the 25th of April 2015, Gulate was informed that he would be executed by firing squad, with Indonesia necessitating a 72-hour notice to prisoners of their pending execution under Indonesian law. He was then taken to Busakambangan Island in central Java, there, Burroughs met with Gulate minutes before his execution at the request of his family, with his last rites given under the Roman Catholic faith. Burroughs said that Gulate continued to hear voices in his head, stating he believes the voices more than he does anybody else. According to his lawyer, Ricky Gunwan, and Burroughs, he had no idea that he was going to be executed until a few hours before his execution. According to Burroughs, who explained that he was going to be executed, Gulate was calm as he was handcuffed by prison officials, but became agitated when he was handed over to police outside the jail, who put leg chains on him and said to Burroughs, Oh father, am I being executed? When Burroughs confirmed this and said to Gulate that he had been telling him, Gulate replied, This is not right. I made one small mistake and I shouldn't have to die for it. When asked by Gunawan what his last wish was, Gulate laughed and asked if he was like Aladdin and could have three wishes. He was executed by firing squad in the early morning hours on the 29th of April 2015, just after midnight at the age of 42. Gulate was executed alongside Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumaran, members of the infamous Bali Nine. Nigerians Rahim Agbaje Salami, also known as Jamiur Owolabi Abashin, Sylvester Obikwe, Martin Anderson Okwulidi Oyan Tanze and Indonesian Zainal Abidin. By the way, we will be doing a future video on the Bali 9, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of when that video comes out. The prisoners sang, Bless the Lord, O oh My Soul, before their singing was cut short by the firing squad. Of the 12-man firing squad, in line with Indonesian legislation and precedent, only three of the rifles were loaded with live ammunition, so that the firing squad would not know who shot the lethal shots. Mary Jane Veloso was due to be executed, but saved at the last minute. By the way, we did a video on Veloso, so don't forget to check that video out. Gulate's body was taken to St. Carlos Hospital in Jakarta, with his body transported back to Brazil per his request. His execution further divided relations between the Brazilian and Indonesian governments, with President Rousseff stating that it was a serious event, and the Secretary General of Foreign Affairs, Sergio D'Anes, reiterated Brazil's stance against the death penalty at the Itamarati Palace in Brasilia. Secretary General of the United Nations Ban Ki-moon expressed deep regret over Gulate's execution, as well as the execution of the other seven individuals. Gunawan said that his execution was outrageous, and said that Indonesia had closed its eyes and ears. On the 30th of April 2015, a Catholic Mass was celebrated in honour of him. His body was flown to Sao Paulo before he was taken by car to Curitiba, arriving on the 3rd of May 2015. A wake took place at the Pauke Iguaku Cemetery before he was buried in Curitiba at 3.15pm. During the burial, his mother wept aloud beside the priest. Thank you for watching, please do yourself a favour and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to inform you of when new videos come out. Also, why not hit that like button and leave a nice comment, it helps more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day and don't forget, 
that truth is always more interesting than fiction.